read that for me? <laughs> okay, let's see. Let me move this. Can you still read that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, let me give you this. Sorry, so that the people on Zoom can hear it. Oh. Virtually every top producing agent we have ever worked with has a has a deep and almost inherent sense of service. They have a servant's heart and place their buyers or sellers real estate experience above all else. They are always thinking service. So, um, and Eric and, oh, it looks like Austin and Cade are on Zoom. Feel free to speak up if you, if you guys want. But what are some examples that you guys have heard about or have already experienced with service and real estate? Cash. Yeah, sorry. Is this one working too? Hello? All right, cool. Perfect. Um, one of the things, um, both me and Tyler actually participated in it, but um, Todd and Carl just had a listing that just went live and we re-landscaped their whole house um, before they listed it. So that was a pretty cool service project. It was really cool to yeah. see their full service approach to everything. So, I love that. And did you guys get paid for that? No. I didn't. Did you get paid? No. Welcome to real estate. Yeah. <laughs> you do the service, right? And the business will follow. That's right. You get, yeah. you got paid in karma, which is awesome. Um, awesome. So let's see. I'm just really bad at these slides. So just bear with me guys. Uh oh, it's happening. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Hold on. Okay. So a great agent and client communication. Um, so let's talk about, oh, wow. I am all kinds of, hold on guys. This is skipping. There we go. Okay. So the whole goal is at the end of the session, you guys will be able to identify the key information uh, to build success with buyers and sellers. You'll employ strategies to assist buyers and sellers with their decision-making, and you'll build a strong foundation relationship with their clients and co-op agent. And never discount the relationship you build with your co-op agents. It is massively important, and I'll give you guys some examples uh, here soon. Um, Tyler, what are you hoping to learn today? I mean, you kind of hit it on the ballpark, just the, not even just like the success of getting a, a house or like a listing or anything like that, but just the success of like building another friendship, I guess. And because that only leads to even more opportunities, you know? So Love it. I'd say just building and being successful as like, a person and helping people. Awesome. And are you newly licensed? I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. And cash. Yeah. You're newly licensed. Yep. Okay. And what are you hoping to learn today? Um, just some more strategies that I can provide value to all my clients. I mean, Perfect. that's yeah. Perfect. Love it. And who do we have? Do we still have Austin? Austin, can you speak up and tell me what you're hoping to learn today? You bet. Yeah, I'm hoping to learn the things I don't know, I don't know. Love that. And Cade, what about you? Are you able to unmute? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. What are you hoping Can, to learn today? Um, really just the, uh, you know, I'm I'm fairly new to real estate and just trying to pick up as much as I can and apply those principles to my career and the way that I approach things. So awesome. And Austin, were you are you new in real estate as well? Um, I've been around for about a year or so. Okay, awesome. And have you been at KW that whole time? Yes. Awesome. 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 Hi, Carla. Um, we are on, we're just getting started. We started a little late today. So thank you for joining us. Carla, can you unmute yourself? My name's Amber Sorensen. Can you unmute yourself and let me know what you're wanting to learn today?
Is she able to do that? Oh, maybe not. Okay, no worries. So one of the number one things with client communication or with client service is communication. That is going to be at the heart of all of the service that you, this is not working. There we go. Sorry, I am not tech savvy. Some people would say I am, but I am not. <laughs> okay, no, you're okay. So communication is going to be at the key of every service you guys do. And communication is gonna do four, four things. It's gonna provide a strong foundation for sustaining a relationship. It's gonna set and manage expectations proactively throughout the transaction. It's gonna create peace of mind for your clients and it's going to enhance your credibility. The one thing that I want to uh, really focus on today is managing expectations. If you guys are unaware, we are in a shifting market. We've just come off of an unprecedented seller's market. Seller's expectations are very high right now and buyers have lost hope. So we're kind of moving into an area where buyers are gonna be able to start getting some of their hope back. And sellers are going to have to realize that we're moving into a healthier market and they don't get to ask for everyone's first more child. So it's important that we manage those expectations from the get go um, and make sure that everyone's aware um, of what's going on. And it's really important to note, too, that you can rarely over communicate with your clients. Um, I don't think I've ever had a complaint once that I've over communicated with a client. There's just there's no way to do that. There we go. Nope. Okay, three levels of service, purpose, value propos proposition, and fiduciary. So um, there was something I wanted to share with you guys right there, but just remember that you're supposed to serve your clients at the highest level possible. That's your fiduciary duty is to serve them at the highest level possible. And the first point of that is purpose. And basically purpose is masters of service have a clear understanding of why they should be hired and can articulate it to anyone at any time. You guys have already learned about your value proposition, correct? Yes. Who is feeling really confident in their value proposition? We got to get more yeses, guys. Let's all work on our value propositions. Value proposition is the second level of service. Um, and it is about translating your purpose and translating those into specific areas of service and specific set of services. And then the all important fiduciary. A fiduciary brings a level of care and trust to the relationship. This is super important. Um, and that goes back to your value proposition. If you don't already, and if it's authentic to you as a person and as an agent, I would highly recommend you including something in your value proposition about how you care for your clients and how you intend to service them. What is the difference between functionary and fiduciary? Does anyone know? Um, transactional. I don't think it, I don't think it turned on. There, there we go. Functionary is more transactional and fiduciary is where you actually care about them. Like you said, at the highest level. Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe I'll give this back to you next time you talk into it. We'll see if they can hear you. So give me some examples of, actually, you guys have a chart, I believe in your participation guide. Do you guys see that there? Give me some examples. Let me get to it. Of functionary, what stands out to you on functionary? Um, kind of just like a 
a basic thing just by glancing at it. Like the first two for both of them, for functionary, it's low level, low relationship and fiduciary is high level, high relationship. And kind of just going down, like there's employee on functionary, partner on fiduciary. It just feels like functionary, you're more, you're just working for them, you know? Fiduciary, you're friends, like you actually care. Um, and then it also says minimally paid for functionary and fiduciary is highly paid. That's not a huge, well, I guess for, for us, like, it's our livelihood. <clears throat> so it is a big part for us. But I feel like the all the agents that show that they truly care for their clients and everything, they're always the ones that are at the top. Whereas the ones that are functionary and just go through the motions, they aren't as near as everyone else. Yeah. Does anyone else have anything that stands out to them on that list? I've got one. Andrew. Yes, please catch. Um, on fiduciary, I was just looking through this list. The two things that stick out to me is big picture viewpoint and advises and consults. Love that. What what talk to me more about that? Sure. Um, just if you're if you're functionary, obviously you're probably just focused on just this transaction. You're not really thinking about the entire scope of what your client experience is going to be like and you know what their hopes and what their goals are um the other thing is with advises and consults you're not an employee you're not just being told all right go do this and then you know you run over here and do that you're saying hey if you want the best possible outcome this is what i would recommend like does that make sense yep cool. love it love it and that that one's working for you guys so we're good okay perfect Dual agency. Who knows what dual agency is? And people on Zoom, please feel free to unmute and speak up too. And does our brokerage allow it? They do not, not a chance. Why is that? Because Dean said so. <laughs> Why do you think Dean said so? Okay. Fiduciary. Limitations of your fiduciary, okay. Yeah, I mean, fiduciary is providing them with the highest experience, right? And if you're representing both of them, you can't possibly do that. So, exactly. So, a lot of agents feel that it's a bummer when you can't double end deals. Um, I actually think it's a bummer when you do double end deals because of that purpose um, or because of that reasoning. And in my consults, I actually use that as a selling point to use me as opposed to someone at a different agency or a different brokerage. Um, and people don't realize the difference in dual agency versus exclusive. And they're like shocked. They have no idea that there was an option there or anything like that. They love when I explain to them that our brokerage truly believes in every party having their own representation that is loyal only to them. Um, so if that's not in your consultations, I would highly recommend putting that in. We're just gonna skip over those slides since we just don't do that here. I don't see the point of spending time on it. Okay, hold on. There we go. Okay, so the transaction process is really unique and I feel like this class kind of skips around a little bit. So bear with me guys, but the transaction process is really unique and it's also something that most people only do once or twice in their lifetime or if you have an investor or something they do it more um but people are probably only going to buy and sell houses a few times maybe a handful of times in their entire life whereas you're doing it every day so the process is going to seem really easy to you guys and you're going to pick it up and you're going to know it and it's going to be second nature but to all of your people it's not going to be so what I do in my consults is I have a whole diagram. Wow, that is really loud. And I go through, it kind of looks like this. And then tears out. And then, so this is like title, 
lending, due diligence, acceptance of offer. Um, down here, I would have a dollar sign and then a little side cast talking about earnest money. And this, how much should earnest money be? 1%. 1%, perfect. And you guys weren't around, but about 10 years ago, it was $500, no matter the purchase price. So a lot of people that bought in that market are absolutely shocked that it needs to be at least 1% in this market. So make sure you set that expectation up front. I've had buyers think I was absolutely completely lying to them that it had to be so much until we started writing offers. And then they realized that $500 is laughable at this point. So this needs to be 1%. And that goes back to setting expectations. Um, so this is choosing your agent. Consult. Either listing. Well, this would be showing homes. And you should also have one for sellers. So choosing agent, consult, listing prep. And this is just a really rough draft. Listing goes live, marketing, what does that look like? This should all be written out so that you're setting the expectations for the transaction process. Um, what else under marketing? Offer review. Who's reviewed offers with sellers yet? Anyone? Okay. I'm gonna send out to you guys a spreadsheet that I use. We are kind of moving out of multiple offers, but it's still a thing. And it's important for you guys to be able to review those. And I think that will come up in a later session as well. But I'm gonna send you guys out my Excel spreadsheet for that. And I'll also send you guys out my flow charts. Um, everyone really loves the flow chart. It enables the visual learners to really see the process and be able to put it into, um, into a good perspective. So let's see if it's gonna work. Let's set time expectations. And that is where this, this is what's gonna start that conversation is your flow chart of setting time expectations. This is gonna set, help you start with all expectations. What are some time expectations that we need to set with our clients? Any ideas? Like the time they want to, like if, it, if it's a buyer, time they want to be in, in the house and okay. the seller, maybe the time they want to like sell. Perfect. Okay. What else? Um, just all the deadlines. Those are extremely important for setting expectations, um, like earnest money, right? That's a big one. Um, yep. yeah, all the other deadlines in the contract and your offer and how to use those to make them competitive too. Perfect. So, and when is earnest money due? Four days after acceptance. Perfect. So a lot of people feel like earnest money just needs to be available at closing, right? A lot of people are shocked when they're like, oh, I have to have that money right now. So make sure you have that conversation with them. If they don't have it, can it be gifted? Explain to them what that looks like. Um, it's also important that you, and Tyler, you kind of mentioned this too. Uh, you find out what their timeline is. And Cash, I think you mentioned this as well, but you have to figure out what it looks like for their family, um, for their employment, for do their kids have bedtimes? Do they not want showings at certain times? Do they um, need an offer by a certain date? All of those things are really important. Showing homes, how late can they show homes? How early can they show homes? Can they only show homes or see homes after work? What does that look like? Are you available during those times? Do your time expectations line up? Those are all really important. Also, it's, it's imperative that you guys let them know about time is of the essence. That is a contractual obligation that they know that they need to be responsive to you as well as to the contract negotiations. Um, we've had horror stories where people have gone off on vacation and their agent hasn't been able to get a hold of them and they've lost earnest money and then they blame their agent. 
There's lots of things, but it's because those expectations weren't set up front that you need to be available. If you're not going to be, how can we work around this? Make sure all of that. In my buyer and seller consultation, I always talk about my vacations coming up during the time of our contract, as well as do you guys have anything planned? And let's figure out how to work around that, okay? Um, the next is, why is this not working? There we go. Document expectations. Um, so you're gonna likely go over the contract before you ever see a house. What I highly recommend is during your buyer and seller consultations, after you've gone over and had them sign your ERS or your BBA, which is your buyer broker agreement or your exclusive right to sell, you also send them home with a REPC. And you highlight in there all of the blank spaces and you say, I'm just gonna send this home with you. You can review it. Let me know if you have any questions. The first offer that we write, I'll review it in depth with you, but make sure that they have that. Your fiduciary duty is to make sure that they understand what they're signing. A lot of agents, they send over a contract and they just say, sign it. And the people have no idea what they're signing. Part of your value needs to come for making sure that they clearly understand every single thing that they're signing. That is your job as their agent. Um, if we are not teaching them about the process and about what they're agreeing to, what good are we as agents? Anyone can go sign anything. Anyone can blindly agree to whatever. Um, what are some contracts or documents that they have to sign? Other than the BBA. Wire fraud, yep. What was that? Your guys' team addendum? No, no, no. Oh, the disclosure addendum. Yep, KW disclosure. And does anyone not know what that addendum is? People on Zoom, please speak up. This one's important. If you don't know what that is. Exactly. Yep. The owners of this particular location of KW own stake and title and other things. Um, exactly. But we, you're not forced to use them. What else needs to be signed? For your protection. Why is that one important? Perfect. And if they waive their inspection, is there anything else they need to sign? Yes. Yes. With the seller's market that we've been in, Dean has required that now if they waive appraisal, financing, or due diligence, that they have to sign a basically a release of liability for it. And if they have a due diligence, but they waive getting it by a professional inspector, then they also have something they need to sign. And I believe that's in broker docs, but I could be wrong on that. Um, what else? Okay. What else? This one's a real big one. <laughs> talking about all documents. The REPC. Think buyer. What else do the buyers need to sign? Yep. Um, I, the two things I can think of that aren't up there, the buyer broker agreement and the ERS. Okay. What's that? Besides those. Yep. I'll okay. put those on here, but besides those, this one goes 
this one goes directly into what we're talking about today and your fiduciary duty and your service. Have you guys heard about the buyer due diligence checklist? Okay, the buyer due diligence checklist is required for every buyer to sign before you get paid. It is on the MLS. And basically what it does is it goes over everything that anyone's ever been sued over as representing themselves as during the transaction. So let me, I'll, I'll read off all of them. Building code and zoning compliance officer, rental of property, so property manager. You guys all know you cannot act as a property manager in this brokerage, correct? Okay. Um, hazardous waste and toxic substances, professional, radon gas specialist, surveying and staking, home warranty plans, flood zone and insurance, homeowners insurance, title issues and homeowners association issues, physical condition, square footage and acreage, utility services, water, geologic conditions, mold, housing compliance, property taxes, public infrastructure districts or PIDs, income tax and legal consequences, foreign investment and real property tax act, and energy efficiency. All of those things are things that we cannot advise our client on during our process. And it actually goes against our fiduciary duty to do those things. Um, there are a few times, well, every time you're gonna be walking through a home with a buyer and, or you're gonna be at a listing appointment and they're gonna ask like, is this a load bearing wall? Or, you know, is this energy efficient? And you can always say, I believe so. But if it's important to you, we can talk to a professional that is licensed in that area. Always protect yourself that way um, and represent yourself as what you truly are. And that is simply a real estate agent only. That is all you are. You are not any of these other things. If you are a contractor and you're licensed or something like that, great, that goes into your value proposition. But if you are not, you are not. So I highly recommend, and I'd imagine the team, uh, if you guys are all on, trans, are you guys all on Transcend? Is that, okay. Um, has a lot of these vendors, but radon gas, surveying, get those vendors in your Rolodex right now. Does everyone know what a Rolodex is or am I aging myself? I just realized you guys are all very young, um, but get those in your database and make sure you have those readily available. And um, let's see. Is there anything else? We went over wire fraud, KW disclosure, FYP. Oh, what about the seller's property condition disclosures? What's important to know about seller's property condition disclosures? To the best knowledge of the seller, so that when the buyer, like if the new buyer comes in and they're like, oh, and who fills that out? The sellers. Are you allowed to fill out any part of that other than the very top portion? No, never. And just in case you guys aren't aware, this did just get updated. It was originally six pages and now it's something like 16 or something crazy. Um, you don't have to use that in your current transactions, but if you wanted to be extra, I'd recommend it. Um, a lot of sellers feel like you can fill those out for them. It's important that they know that those have to be filled out by them and you are not allowed to touch them. So make sure you set that expectation. Um, and that anything, you also need to set the expectation with those, that anything that you have been disclosed, so anything that they've told you about the property, you have to disclose as well. So they have to put it on there, just do it. And it is what it is, and we'll find a way to work around it. Okay, let's set communication expectations. What are some communication expectations that we should be setting with our clients? Preferred method of contact. Preferred method of contact. 
Okay. What else? Kind of like, um, you should be available like as much as you can, but like if you have an appointment or a vacation to where you might not be able to respond as fast, you should let them know so they're not thinking you're like ignoring them or something. Okay. Do you have to be available 24 seven in this business? No. No. You don't have to be. You do not have to be. As long as you set those expectations up front. What I do in my buyer and seller consultations is, and it was, I, I was scared to do it for a long time, but my mental health needed it because I was feeling so burned out on real estate, especially in this market. Um, I wake up at five every morning. My clients don't know that. What they do know is that between 8.30 and nine, I will respond to every text that came through during the night. Nine to 11 is my focused work. I may take a little bit longer to respond. That's my lead gen time. And between 11 and eight at night, they have free reign to text me. I will respond just as quickly as I can. And after eight, barring any emergencies, that is my personal time. I'm allowed to have a life. I have gotten no pushback on that. In fact, every single client that I have had that I have set those expectations with, their exact words have been, we absolutely respect you and respect that. And they have. I went to Cancun last fall and I did have someone and I highly recommend you guys do this as well. Partner with an agent and have a relationship with them. And it's just known that if one of you is out of town, you help the other person. Um, I have Sherry Booth. She's a 20 year veteran in real estate. Her and I have been best friends since our century 21 days. We came over to Keller Williams together. Um, and it has been absolutely the best thing ever to know that we have each other in our businesses. And during our consults, we actually mention each other to our clients and let them know if I have a trip, if I have a family emergency, I have an agent and she has your back and it helps them to realize, oh, she may not be available after 8 p.m. because she's making sure she's good for me the next day, but she always has someone ready, willing and able to help me. Um, you are the boss of your business. And I think that gets forgotten about in real estate. If being available 24 seven works for you, by all means do it. If it doesn't work for you, just set those expectations up front. And I promise your business will not be harmed at all. Um, so what else? Oh, the other thing that I set with my clients is that I'm not available on Sundays. That is not a spiritual thing. It's a personal thing. Um, and it's the easiest day in Utah for it to happen without me jeopardizing my clients, my clients' transactions. Have I ever worked on a Sunday? Absolutely, yes, I have. I have worked all day Sunday if it meant getting my client the house and I let them know that. If there is an offer deadline or something like that on a house that we've seen on Saturday, I will absolutely work for them on Sunday. However, if there isn't, I just ask that I be given Sunday to recharge, reset so that I'm 100% for you come Monday. It helps me not hating my job. It helps me to not resent my clients and it keeps me all in the happy zone with this, with this industry that kind of kicks the trash out of you. So... Um, one thing that I would also recommend in setting communication expectations is that if there are times that you are not available as an agent and you have a listing that you put those expectations in the listing or in the agent remarks on the MLS, um, let other agents know when they can get a hold of you and when they can't so that if they have an emergency with their own client, they know how to address it. Um, again, I will work in my off hours. And I don't feel like that has hurt my business at all, but I do feel like my mental health and me being happy with what I'm doing leads me to be a better uh, agent for my clients. So figure out what works for you. Be honest and authentic to who you are, what your family's needs are. Um, a real estate business is great, but if you're missing all of your kids' soccer games, what good is it? So we got into real estate for a little bit of freedom as well. You're allowed to have that, okay? Um, it's also important that you set those expectations. You allow them to set their expectations of you. So one thing that I ask in my buyer and seller consults is, what is it that you're expecting of me? Are you expecting me to be available 24 seven? Are you expecting weekly updates? Are you expecting phone calls? Um, I've always put group buyers, whether that be husband and wife or friends in a group text. So everyone's always aware. 
The only time that that differs is if, like right now I have some clients, uh, then unfortunately there's a protective order between them. So they can't be communicated um, in the same text. But even in a divorce situation, everyone is on the same thing. I promise it keeps you out of being the mediator and, and the divorce therapist. Um, so set all those expectations up front. Any questions or thoughts on that? Any concerns that you have or disagree me, disagreeing with me, which is totally okay. A lot of agents like to be available 24 seven. I really enjoyed your comment about being a divorce therapist. Yeah, <laughs> it's a thing. You were like, we're like hair, hair stylists. You, we wear all the hats, so. <laughs> which is why the buyer due diligence is so important. <laughs> the uh, buyer due diligence checklist. Um, all right, let's move on to contingencies. Hey, yeah. Can I say one more thing? Yeah. Um, I think going along with setting expectations for communication, um, frequency of contact. Yes. Because there are a lot of people that don't want to be bugged every single day. And then there are people that do. And so yeah. just knowing what their, like you said, their expectations of you for communication and frequency is important. I so. love that. Yep. I love that. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, so setting contingencies, this goes back to me recommending that you guys have someone to cover for you. Um, the one thing I also do is anytime I'm going to be out of the office or unavailable outside my normal hours, I will text every active client that I have going and I will personally let them know, Hey, I'm going to be out of town for the weekend. I have someone available to show you homes. Please reach out to me. I'm still available. Or I may be out of service. Please reach out to Sherry. She will have service. She's here working this weekend. Make sure you're the one that tells them that you're out of town, not someone else. Make sure they don't find out on social media. Make sure they know, okay? Um, and there was something else. Um, again, important to introduce all of that during your consultation. But always end with when it is necessary, time is always of the essence and everyone must act quickly when it is necessary. And um, that's really, really important. You never wanna be ghosted by your clients during a transaction. Set up to date market expectations. What does that look like in the shifting market? What are you guys, what are you guys wanting to do or have planned to do with your clients to set market expectations? Any ideas? Go for it. Um, just like you said, the market shifting. So it depends on if you're working with a buyer or a seller, but with buyers, you know, let them know we can be a little bit more competitive than we used to be. It's shifting a little more in their favor. So it's balanced. Um, and then with sellers, you know, Hey, we're not going to get probably 70 offers on your home. Like that's not really a thing anymore. And yeah. so, just staying up to date on what the market's doing so that you can coach them. Perfect. Love it. What else? What are some other things that we can do on a weekly, monthly, regular basis for our clients? Any ideas? Anyone on Zoom? You guys have any ideas? I guess you guys are over here, not over there. Austin, Carla, or Cade? Nothing. No one wants to talk. <laughs> um, um one thing yeah. that i oh sorry I, I know yeah but just kind of like what cash said just a minute ago i think you know finding out what they want out of you what they don't want right just setting those expectations for each other perfect love that um another thing is something that a lot of agents have talked about is doing monthly market updates right it's a good way to get 12 touches in a year yep so and where do you guys get the information for that um, steal it from somebody. <laughs> the MLS. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the MLS has a tool section, just so you guys are aware. Um, the graphs can be a little overwhelming. Uh, Becca Summers, I don't know if she's taught any of these classes, but she is killer at graphs and numbers. If you're ever not sure what one means, run it by Becca and she'll like give it to you in layman's terms in a way that you can explain it to your clients to sound amazing. Um, one thing that I highly recommend, and this is part of your fiduciary duty, have weekly check-ins with your lenders on every buyer you are working with. Mortgage rates are going crazy. 
Uh, buyers that were pre-approved just two weeks ago are no longer pre-approved. We have buyers under contracts on homes with builders that they have been under contract and building their dream home for a year that now cannot qualify to close on it. Um, it's important that you're touching base with your lenders and that they are constantly reworking the numbers for your buyers. This is something that you guys can do to add value that shows that you care, that shows that you're staying on top of the market and that you're attentive to your client situation. If they have a monthly budget that they cannot go over, a lot of them can no longer buy and be comfortable. So you need to be touching base with your lenders on a weekly basis. Um, who do you guys use at Transcend for your lending? Okay, Interland. Okay, perfect. Um, I guess I figured that, but um, make sure that, that you guys are talking to them every, all the time. And then make sure that your clients know you are too. That really is, my clients have so appreciated that lately. Um, we also have 50 Friday. Do you guys get that email from Dean? 50 Friday? He just started doing that. And in every one of those emails, he talks about what has happened this past week, but he also gives you the MLS stats uh, for the week, which is really valuable. Take a screenshot, post it to your social media, send it out to all your active clients, let them know you're on top of the market. Um, also be engaged in real estate, uh, Facebook groups and social media. We have a few really awesome Facebook groups here in the Wasatch Front. One is Wasatch Front Agents. It's probably the biggest of all of them. And it is all agents on the Wasatch Front Regional MLS talking about the market, sharing how their open houses went, sharing how their showings went, what price points are slowing down, what price points are still hot and heavy. Be part of those conversations um, or at least be a witness to them. And, in, and reading through those comments and seeing what everyone is, is experiencing. Um, let's see, the UCAR, is it UCAR? Nope, it's the actual MLS, sends out a monthly email. They're always about a month late because they have to compile all of it, but they always send out a Instagram square of the market with days current days on market and how it compared to last year, medium price point and how it compared to last year. A lot of teams and agents recreate that for their own brand, but you don't have to do that. Just take it from that email and post it to your social media. Um, lots of awesome ways to stay up cheap and uh, really not very time consuming ways to spend or to keep your clients updated. Set expectations seamlessly with your KW Tech. Who's using KW Tech right now? Command, all of those things. Perfect. How are you guys liking it? Good. Awesome. So they have a few things in there um, that are really awesome. The one thing that we're going to talk about right now is the custom checklist and smart plans in your opportunity section. You can basically set that up and send your clients a link so that they know every step of the process of where you are in the transaction and what's coming next and what's expected of them and what they can expect of you. So if you don't have those prepped, I would highly recommend getting those taken care of. Um, also, there's a few items that are always left out of those. And I think it's important. Um, it's a set an expectation for asking for a referral or a review. And we do go into that a little bit later, but mark those in your opportunities checklist as well. So one, you remember to do it. And two, they know that it's coming. Um, and that way, if there's anything that they can't quite get to a five-star review on, that's an open discussion throughout the whole transaction. And you guys are able to combat any of those issues. Three steps to getting referrals. Here we go. So the first step is to provide value. The next step is to ask for help. And the third step is to reward. So anytime the reward to me is the best part. I have a client that has referred to me I mean, she shouts my name from the rooftop, which is just the sweetest thing. And every time I send her something and then she texts me, she's like, you don't have to send me a crumble gift card. You don't need, I don't need Starbucks. I just love you. And I want everyone to know. But she loves those crumble gift cards and she loves those Starbucks gift cards. And it means a lot to her that I value her enough to send her five, 10, $15 every time she refers someone to me because of her, I have a $700,000 new build under contract. 
and I'm working with her brother-in-law who's in the 650 range. They just closed a month ago. We were under contract with Fieldstone. They were in like the four, 400 range. Um, and she's just a raving fan. So she wrote a review for me without being asked, but I have lots of people that have loved me, but I never asked for one. And so I don't have the reviews and I kick myself every day. Um, so if you know you're providing value and you know you're giving good service, ask for that review, set the expectation up front that you're going to ask for it. And if they ever feel like they can't give you a five-star review, figure it out, fix it, get that review. It's so important. Go ahead. Where, where do you have them review you at? Yes. So I have a Google business page. Okay. So when people, you know, Google Amber Sorensen real estate or Utah, Utah County real estate, my name normally comes up somewhere in the search. I'm not as great at some as getting right at the top, but I'm in there. So I have them go, uh, review me there. I also, I cringe to say this, but I have them review me on Zillow. Whether we like Zillow or we don't like Zillow, people are using Zillow. It's important that you have a presence there. Um, and I also have a Facebook business page that I have them review me on. And there are lots of, lots of places for that. Um, I would highly recommend that you make sure that your profiles are up to date on Trulia, um, Zillow, Google, Facebook. Um, what are some other ones? I'll have to think. There are some other ones that you just automatically are gonna have a profile on and it may not be up to date, but you can have reviews there too. Trulia is one, Homescape. I'll try to remember, but those three for sure, if you have those pages, um, I would highly recommend. So I went on a team during COVID for about a year and they were really hot and heavy into asking me to get my people to review me. Um, but a lot of those people hadn't actually worked with me while I was on the team. They'd worked with me prior, but now all of those reviews are on the team's page and not on my page. So if you have, if you're on a team, and you plan to stay on that team or you plan to continue on to a different team, make sure that you're screenshotting those reviews and keeping them in your own pocket so that you can use them at any time. Otherwise, they're always gonna be tied to the team, which isn't, I mean, it's not a horrible thing, but if you ever leave the team, then kind of sucks that they have all your reviews. So. Um, so a few ways that you can reward, I always do like a crumble or a Starbucks for the first one. I'll take them out to lunch um, or let's see what are some other things. I've sent them flowers before. If their kids are doing, um, have any kind of hobby, I'll send their kids something. Moms love it when you spoil their children. Um, I don't know if any of you are parents, but I spoil the children in my transactions so much and closing gifts and just goodies throughout the transaction and my clients love it. So highly recommend that. Um, hey, Amber? Yes. Um, is, is there like an upper limit for like a monetary amount that you shouldn't exceed? Otherwise it becomes an illegal act? Yes. For rewards? Yes, you guys know? I don't know the upper limit. I'm pretty sure it's 150. That could have changed. It was 150 when I started and that's just kind of what I've stuck to. Um, Yeah, it's one, I would say go with 150 just to be safe. Yeah, I would say 150 just to be safe. And what you can't do too, is you can't say, if you give me a review, you get this, right? You can't pay for them. You just get the review or get the referral, you gift it. And the expectation might start getting set in their head. You just can't advertise it, so. Re Reverals and reviews. Correct. Yep. Yep. Um, there is no amount on closing gifts. Yep. You get to do with your commission, whatever you want, whatever your heart desires. So uh, spoil them, don't spoil them, whatever feels right to you guys. Um, any other questions on that? This is something that I highly recommend. Uh, literally this wording is so great. Add it to your buyer and seller console packets. Um, 
and have that discussion with them. I love that wording. I think it's not pushy at all. And I think it's just, I just think it's nice. So I was, I'm going to be adding that to my own. Um, let's see. Seller reviews. So what are some ways, what are some things that you want a seller to say about you in your review? Especially in this market. So if you're helping someone sell their house, then, I mean, for me, if someone helped me get more money, then okay. I would definitely be like, oh, so-and-so helped me get 10,000 more dollars out of my house. So I'd love, like, for me, that's what I would want someone to say for me. Okay, perfect. But what about if you were the buyer's agent? He was able to get the house for cheaper than listing price. Perfect. Um, go ahead. Um, it, it, especially for a seller review, just having it be easy. Like there's a lot that goes into a listing. And so just having your seller not feel absolutely bombarded with all the stuff they have to do and helping facilitate everything. Yeah. And so they made it super easy. It was really quick. Everything was super professional. Um, you know, their quality of work, like quality photography was important. So free stuff, landscape work. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yep. Exactly. I think another thing that I would want personally is for them to say I treated them like family because when people think that think of you like family that just makes them want to help you out with your own business even more and I feel like it just creates a better relationship love that and so he, if they're like oh they're gonna treat you like family no matter what then people are gonna be like oh I want to work with a family person you know yep perfect what are some things unique to a seller in this market well it might not be as big of a deal in the market we're going into um but what are some things that would stand out in a review in this market that you wouldn't necessarily see every agent doing offer reviews making sure they understand the offers talk about making a transaction easy those offers you walk in with that pile of 12 15 20 offers they're going to get overwhelmed real quick um a few of my reviews specifically talk about she helped us understand how what offers what they meant how all of those things if there's something this is the thing in this market everyone's getting overpriced for their home everyone's selling quickly right every agent's offering that right now so you want to ask what would make me stand out in my reviews and then adjust your business to make sure that's what you're offering. Does that make sense? So a buyer right now, what would be something that would stand out in a buyer? Getting closing costs. Did I, sorry, <laughs> getting closing costs or repairs done. Yeah, just because everybody's so used to the market we were moving from you know, just yep. being good at negotiating those things so that we get the best deal for them. Yep. So perfect. Those are things that if you are asking for reviews, if you get those comments and your reviews, you want to blast that in social media, like so loud. Um, a lot of agents are not going above and beyond right now. They don't feel they have to. And a lot of people are getting a real bad taste in their mouth. So if you get those reviews, adjust your service to get those reviews that offer something different in these markets, and then make sure you use those to your advantage as well. Um, what are some ahas from this section? Yes. So, just doing the offer comparison that you're talking about, because in command, you can it'll help you sort through all of that and do that to make it a lot easier too. Yes. And so thank you for reminding me of that. I, I was here before command, so I'm still, Jen just, told I'm not me, as in it as like, either. Tuesday, she, Jen just taught me about it. And, but it's super nice and convenient just cause yeah. 
you don't have to have that fat stack of papers with you. Yeah. You can just pull it up on your computer and be like, here's everything. Which one do you guys like the best? Yeah. And I feel like That's if nice. it's like less words, it's a lot easier for them to look at it and understand and for agents ourselves to explain it. Yeah. So I definitely, when I get listings, want to use that. Love that. I forgot Command offered that, to be honest. So I'm, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm so old school and use Excel and stuff. So <laughs> um, all of us that were here before Command, it's, we've, it's taken us a minute. So <laughs> go ahead. Um, <clears throat> the biggest aha for me is the quality of your reviews. So you don't want people just to go in and just click five stars and then that's it. But what they leave in their review um leaves a clue to your service right yeah. so yeah. and then sharing that on social media and just being active there um was the other big thing right your reviews on facebook um and all your different groups and stuff like that is super important i didn't think of that awesome love it anyone online that had any ahas that they like to share okay let's move on and can i get your name you're, oh, you're on Zoom. Okay, perfect. Um, so we've got Kay, Tyler, Cash, Austin, Carla, and David. Okay, perfect. Um, so you've been kind of with us here. Okay, perfect. Do you have any ahas um, from this first section? Yeah, I think the, I, one of the best ideas is the quality of your reviews. Like Tyler said, like, you're, like, you know, you kind of want to set an expectation as far as, you know, what everyone's getting out of you, right? Yeah. So, Love it. I promise if you guys set those expectations up front of what they can truly and genuinely expect from you, you guys will get a five-star review every time. It's all about communicating those expectations, hands down. That's the best thing you guys can do for your business. Thank you guys for sharing that. Um, oh, we just, there we go. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what buyers want most from their agents. Um, what do you guys see on here? Can you guys see that online? I think you can. Um, what do you see on here? Help. Yeah, more than half. Okay. What else? Help buyer negotiate. Other. What do you guys think is in the other section? Anything that they like value. So anything that's either unique to you and your business that was awesome for them, but anything, for example, something you brought up that I think would be exactly in the other category is their kids' bedtime story or not bedtime stories, but bedtimes and being aware of how often to communicate and when not to communicate. So love that. Yep. So the top three things that are typically in that category, statistically speaking, are help with paperwork, determining what comparable homes we're selling for, and help determine how much the buyers can actually afford. All key things, right? All key things. Okay. Buyers needs analysis. Who has done a buyer consult? How'd it go for you? Good. Did you do a buyer's need analysis in there? Um, no. Okay. What did it look like for you? Why didn't you do one? Um, so I sat, but we did, so Riley has what's called like a buyer 101 uh, certification, right? Which is our buyer meeting. Okay. Um, and so we just went through A to B with the seven steps to what this process is going to look like for you guys. Okay. The next step would be bringing in some of the lenders to figure out how much you're going to be looking for. And then once we have all of that set down and we have those parameters, then we can sit down and just talk about, all right, what are we looking for when we start the home negotiations? Perfect. I do it a little differently than Riley. Riley is a, a rock star. Um, one thing that I do do differently is I do that buyer needs analysis at the consult. And this is why. I like to go on the MLS afterwards and put in all of their criteria see what those houses are pricing at, let the lender know that they're talking to, if we can get in this price range and keep their payment where they want, is that possible? Make sure I'm having that conversation with them. 
Um, and then if it's like completely out of their ballpark, what they're needing, obviously you have to have a hard conversation. So I do it up front, but I think doing it that way is fantastic too. And Riley's obviously a stellar agent. So do whatever way works best for you guys. Um, what is the number one thing that buyer needs analysis does? It gives you the groundwork to know what they want okay. in their house. Okay. Or how a does, starting point, I should say. How does it make them feel? Like what they want matters. Like what they want matters. And does what they want matter? Is it all that matters? Pretty much. It's their half a million dollars, right? Not ours. Um, it absolutely makes them feel like they come first. It is absolutely imperative that you guys have a buyer needs analysis with every buyer at some stage before you start looking for homes. Um, one thing that I do with my buyers that I feel is really key is at the end of the buyer needs analysis, I say, what are the top five, three to five things that if this home does not have, it will simply not work for your family. There is a difference between needs and wants. It's your job to help them kind of figure out what the needs are versus the wants are. If you can find a house with every need, even if it doesn't have a want, would you make an offer? And it makes them start thinking, oh, maybe that want is actually a need and maybe that needs actually a want. Um, but always ask them, what are the top three to five things that this house has to have in order for it to work? Is it four bedrooms because you have five children? Is it seven bedrooms? Is it an office because one parent works from home? Is it an awesome man cave in the garage, right? Ask, figure it out um, and make sure you pay attention. Those top three to five things need to be at the top of your radar every time you're walking through a home with a buyer. Even they may get really emotionally invested in a home. They may walk in. I had my aunt one time, we were showing a FISBO and she walked in and the sellers were there and she just starts crying and the seller sees it. And she turns around to my uncle and she's like, this is our home, John. The house didn't have a lot of the things that they wanted, but she emotionally just felt like it was her home. After we left the house, they did end up buying the home. But after we left the house, I said, okay, hey, these are the top three things that you told me you needed. And this house does not have one of them. What does that look like for you guys in your life? Does it make sense for you? And they were able to realize, wow, I guess we really could work around that. Maybe it's more of a want instead of a need. This ohm offers this, which was main for a living, um, that they were like, oh no, we're young and spry. They're really not. They didn't realize I had mentioned main for a living. And they're like, no, we're fine. We're fine. This home offered it. And once they walk through a house with main for a living, they realized how easy their life will be as they age and everything changed. Keep that dialogue open, keep it flowing. Make sure you're bringing up things. Um, if a buyer like needs a big kitchen when you walk through a home. Is this kitchen big enough for you? Does this give you the space you need to make Sunday breakfast with your five children? Okay, point it out, let them know that those are top of mind for you. It will make them feel like gold, I promise. Um, so review, revisit their needs analysis often. If you guys are um, unaware, our lives change right? Our lives change all the time. Your life can be completely different tonight than it was from this morning. Um, constantly have those conversations with your clients, especially your buyers. Their needs will always come first. And it is your job as their fiduciary to make sure that that happens. Um, you having that constant conversation with them is going to limit the amount of time that you're, you're putting out as well. And it's gonna make it easier for everyone. So I would recommend revisiting your buyer's needs every week with, in your own thing, right? In your own time to saying, okay, we've seen five houses this week. It's had everything that they've said they need and they haven't written an offer on one of them. What do we need to adjust? Have that constantly going, make sure you're making time for those things, have those conversations with them. Um, Tough conversations. This is always fun. Who's had to have a tough conversation with a client? Anyone? 
Yes. What, tell me about that. Share that if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so somebody from my SOI from when I was growing up, it's a really good friend of mine, his mom, um, reached out to me. They're like, we want to buy a house. Heard the market's awesome. Like, this is great. So I did a whole presentation with them. Buyers 101, like this is what to expect. We moved into, you know, Hey, this is, you know, let's get you pre-approved so that we can start figuring out where we're going to look. Right. And, uh, anyways, set them up with a lender, started going through that process and their pre-approval. I think they did get pre-approved. Um, it was like 115,000, something like that. And so having to have that conversation with them, like, Hey, maybe what we need to do is figure out how to get you either a better job yeah. <laughs> or, you know, like this is the reality of the situation. How can we help? Yeah. Right. Love that. that and, and what was, what was the end result? Are you currently helping them still or? Yeah. Yeah. Actually we're, uh, she's talking with the lender today. Um, we're trying to figure out what would make us get a little bit higher. Nice. So we're just going to try and put together a roadmap for them to be like, all right, you know, maybe not this year, but next year, like how do we position ourselves to be able to get into a home Love if that's that. a goal? So that is exactly what you should do as a buyer's agent with a buyer that can't buy is you help them figure out a game plan. You're with them every step of the way you hold their hand, you make sure you're with them on it. Um, what are some other hard conversations that you might have with a buyer? the offer they had on like the home they loved the most wasn't accepted. That one sucks. That one sucks big time. Um, what about setting expectation? Oh, Cash, did you have one? Yes. Okay. Um, interest rates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, stupid little buggers. Yeah. Interest rates. That's kind of a big conversation we need to be having right now. Kind of a big conversation. Um, how about what they can and can't do between now and when they buy. Anyone ever had a, well, you guys are all newer, but anyone ever had a buyer want to go buy a new car after due diligence or after financing and, and appraisal, they think, oh, we're past that deadline. I'm a free agent. I got to go spend all my money now. It sucks. Yeah, they are nightmares. <laughs> I've never personally had it, but I have had several agents that are my friends that have had clients do that. And it is a nightmare. Um, especially in this market where buyers are putting earnest money hard and things like that. Set those expectations, let them know. RC Lily is great. I know it was Memorial Day. Please don't go buy a new washer and dryer for your home you're closing in in a week. Get it on Black Friday or Labor Day or 4th of July or something. Sales happen all year long, okay? Um, let's see. I don't feel this is necessarily a tough conversation, but they do mention, you know, going over the reality of kind of what you were saying, what they can afford, what that will get them. Um, I have had clients on a very expensive wine taste on a very low beer budget, and it is brutal if you do not set those expectations up front. One key thing, and please everyone write this down or take note of it. Always ask your client in the consultation, how honest can I be with you through this transaction? How honest can I be with you through this transaction? A lot of people only ask that of sellers, but especially in this market, it is just as important to ask that of your buyers. How honest can I be with you during this transaction? Let them know that you will always approach everything with respect but that it is your job to make sure they understand the situation they are in, how they can better it, the reality, all of those things. So if you can be honest, it's going to make things a lot easier. I've never had a client say, please don't be honest with me. Asking that question though sets the tone that we may have some hard conversations throughout this process. It just is going to be what it is. Okay. This is a hard thing. They're spending a half a million plus dollars in this market. There's going to be hard conversations. The market is crazy. So it's not crazy. It's an opportunity to learn. I'm trying to switch that in my brain. <laughs> um, so please always ask that um, of buyers and sellers. 
make sure that they understand that showing homes is a process. Um, it is not a one and done type thing. There are a few best practices that I highly recommend you guys put in so that your clients are able to do what they need to do in choosing a home. And that one of the main things is I never will show a buyer more than four to five homes, preferably three in any one outing. Why would, why do you think that is? Yep. Our job is to take the stress out, isn't it? Seeing 10 homes in a day, I will only do that for out-of-state clients that come in that literally only have a day. And I prep them and I let them know this is going to be really overwhelming. So I'm going to have MLS printouts. I'm going to have pens. I'm going to have clipboards. After every house, we're going to rate it zero to 10. I'm going to ask you, would you, if you only had these three choices, which one would you absolutely not offer on? And we're just going to move that out of the pile. We're going to narrow it down. Make sure you're owning and managing how that looks for them because they are going to be absolutely overwhelmed, especially right now where no buyer's really getting everything they want and trying to figure out what's worth it for them to leave behind on that needs analysis is a job all on its own. So were you going to say something, Cash? Sorry, did I talk over? I'm so sorry. Okay, if you remember, raise your hand, just start talking something. <laughs> um, so make sure that you guys set that. On the MLS, you guys all know how to set up listing alerts. Okay, do you guys have that go directly to your clients or do you have that go directly to you? What does Riley recommend? Okay. I have a go to both of us. Okay. So what's your reasoning on that? Um, I do. So I, with the one, so I set up one yesterday and we did a really complex, um, like needs analysis. Mm -hmm. And so the listing alert is extremely specific. Um, and so anything that I feel is fits in their parameters, I want to make sure they see it. And then I also want to make sure I get a copy so that I can be informed. But, and then outside of that, if I see anything that comes up that is a little outside of what their parameters are, then I'll send it to them myself. Does that make sense? Yep. Perfect. Love that. Why do you do the way you do it? Uh, well, I wrote the agents that every time they what they wanted. Okay. And my advice is to spam. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Love that. I don't think there's one wrong way to, or one right way to do it. I think it's based off of your clients. I do tend to have it only sent to me on the express alert and then I go over it and then I send it out to my clients usually um, for a few reasons. One is I want them to think that I'm the one actually looking at those houses and sending them and that I'm actively always looking for them. And two, because I usually do keep my criteria a little bit broader than they would like, simply because agents don't always input to the MLS as they should. Um, not all agents are professionals. They leave a lot of blanks. They explain things incorrectly. They mark things incorrectly. Um, and so I usually will leave my search criteria a little bit broader. And so I will wean those out for them. Every, I do always give them the option though. Um, I have a client that specifically said, no, I do want to see everything. Um, and so they get it. No, no problem. Um, I do always warn them though. And I do recommend you do this, that they will get updates, even when it's put into backup status or when there's a $1,000 price reduction, or when it, the agent remarks are updated, it will get resent out to them. And for some buyers that is very overwhelming. Um, so set that expectation with them. If you're sending it to them as well, that there may be duplicates. Don't freak out. It's not that I'm not paying attention. It's just that something has been updated and it's being sent back out to everyone. So they know it's not you sending it back out. Do you know what I mean? Um, you don't want them thinking like she sent me this an hour ago. Like, why is he sending it again? The, the one thing that, you know, I made sure in mind that I did was, Hey, this is an automatic alert so that we can have first, Perfect. like first priority. And as soon as it pops up, you get it. I get it. 
and we know as soon as it happens. Love that. Um, anything that you get from me personally will be done on my search. Love it. I sense? love that you explain that. That's yeah. perfect. Uh, that's absolutely perfect. Great job. Um, so that number one on there, show only the best properties for your buyer. I don't agree with that. Um, not in this market. There are so few available that if something might work halfway, I think it's important that you still show it to them. Um, and other markets, totally show only the properties that you know will be a slam dunk. Um, you can always make sure you do a map. If you're showing homes in a location um, that you're not familiar with, please go on Google Maps and get to know what's around that area so you can look like a professional when you're showing that home. Lake Ridge High School is just over here. There's a Sprouts down the road. Figure out the area, let them know that you're aware of it. Also, if there's a home in an area that you're not super familiar with, do a CMA on it if you have time before you go out there. Make sure you're familiar with the comps in the area so that you can be educated um, and can come off as the professional. Um, I do CMAs. I don't do CMAs before I show homes. It mentions that you should. I don't. I feel like I'll do that. If they're interested, then I'll run a CMA on it before we offer. And I do that on every property right now because the market is changing so quickly and appraisals are so volatile that even if I know that a house is underpriced or I know that it's overpriced, I will run a CMA so that they feel more confident in whatever number that they're, they're offering. So I use, <laughs> I use the MLS CMA to get the comps and then I import them into cloud and I use that presentation. So I kind of hybrid it a little bit. I love the fluffiness of cloud but I don't feel it pulls the best comps. So, yeah. 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 It does. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And you know where you can enter in those comps, right? Okay. Just on the bottom on the left hand side. Um, let's see. Really quick, one thing I'm going to, to say here too. And I thought it was mentioned, I remember it being mentioned. One thing that I would recommend um, is set the expectation with your buyers as to how long you have in each home. Some buyers are really quick and they can be in and out of a 5,000 square foot home in five minutes and know it's not for them. Others will take an hour and hate it the whole time, but still wanna walk through the whole thing. So make sure you set the expectation that we're gonna have 30 minutes in each home and what I do, I still do printouts. I'm old school. So I still do paper printouts for the MLS. And on top of every one, I write what our time slot is so that they have that in front of them as well. So that if I end up having to say, hey, you know, we do need to get going to the next one, they are already prepped for that. Um, I keep that an open conversation. I've, you, you just don't want to be like having to reschedule and look unprofessional to other agents which is actually a great segue into this subject, which is um, showing homes means agent interaction. So this is really important. And I feel like a lot, hold on, did we skip? No, there we go. Um, I feel like a lot of agents overlook this. Having a good interaction with your co-agent will win or lose you the deal. I promise you that. Um, Every single offer that I've ever had accepted, the agent has come back and said, I took to my clients how great you have been to communicate with through this process. And that meant a lot to them. So not only did you guys provide an awesome offer, but we know you're going to be great to work with throughout the process. And that gave us peace of mind. Make sure you're communicating. Other things, make sure you're reading the MLS agent remarks. They don't put that in there because they're not trying to be helpful. They put that in there so you can be a professional and have the information you need to represent your client and to make educated decisions. Always read the agent remarks. Um, also, you will get called out and you will be blacklisted, I promise you. <laughs> um, there are blacklists in this industry. Um, no one talks about them, but we all have them. So um, make sure you're reading those. Also, make sure you're reading the uploaded documents. That is so important. Um, the seller's disclosures can be uploaded sometimes, 
property lines can be uploaded, um, up, upgrades, receipts can be uploaded, best practices for offers and maybe what the seller's expectations or needs are could be uploaded to the documents. There's so much information in those. Also, if it's a home that needs a lead based paint disclosure, that's usually uploaded. Make sure you include it with your offer, save everyone the time. Um, come off as a professional. 1979 or older, 1978 or older. Yeah, one of those. Yeah, 78, thank you. Um, so make sure you're doing that. What I always do, um, a lot of agents are doing the showing time, which is great. Use that if it's on the MLS to schedule the showing. I always still will reach out via text to the agent and say, hey, I have a showing scheduled. Thank you so much. Is there anything that I need to know about this property that's not already on the MLS? And I'll usually point out something that was on the MLS to show that I've read the remarks. People love it. They eat it up. They think you're the best. Um, start that conversation with them. Also, you're going to learn real quick if they're going to be a good agent to work with as well. If they're not responding to you, make sure you set that expectation with your clients. Don't say they're not responding to you, but just set the expectation that we may have a little bit longer time to respond or we may have a little bit more time before they respond to us. Things may be a little bit slower kind of a thing. Set that expectation um, with them. Also make sure that you are confirming appointments if you're setting them in advance. So in the last couple of years, gone are the days that you would set appointments in advance. Normally we're just all running out frantic to a home, but we're going back into that where schedules might be getting, you might be scheduling showings on a Saturday, the Tuesday before, right? Because it will still be available. So make sure you're confirming appointments if you're setting them more than 24 to 48 hours in advance with your buyers, as well as with the listing agent um, or with showing time, make sure that you stay on top of if that's been updated. Also, please read the showing instructions and showing time. Do you guys know that there are showing instructions and showing time? Do you guys know what a CVS code is? No one knows what a CVS code is? Do you guys know what a super lockbox is? Yeah. Okay. CVS code is an extra security feature that some agents, me included, put on their lockboxes. That means that in order to show the property, not only do you have to have a super key, but you also have to have an appointment because once you've had a confirmed appointment in the showing time app, it will give you the CBS code. Some agents hate it. I really don't care. Um, my clients love it. It helps them feel more protected. Go ahead. Yeah, it'll be a really annoying, loud beeping sound that will make you feel like you failed your clients in front of them. Uh, just let them know it's an extra security feature and it's nothing to be alarmed by. Um, but we have a lot of agents flooding this market right now, and they're not all in it to be of service to their clients. They're in it to make a quick buck. So we have agents accessing homes without appointments, accessing incorrect homes, um, taking it upon themselves to get their clients in at any cost. We have families living in these homes. We have children walking around. We have men and women out of showers. We have families putting their kids to bed. All kinds of things are happening in these homes and agents aren't respecting that. So some agents are gonna have CBS codes on their lock boxes. Make sure you know that beforehand so that you don't look unprepared at the showing. And that should always be listed in the showing time remarks um, and the showing instructions. I usually will put it in agent remarks too. Hey, there's a CBS code on this lockbox, but not all agents do that. So if you do decide to do that on your listings, put it in agent remarks. Um, okay, what are some things we should have in our home tour toolkit? And yes, these should be in your car at all times. Who has a home tour toolkit in their car? Do it, highly recommend. Um, Obviously masks and things like that, sanitizing wipes. Those are all kind of newer things within the last couple of years. But the one thing that I use the most is a tape measure. It's super important as well as toilet paper. Um, should our clients and us be using the toilets at these homes? No. Are you gonna sometimes have a five-year-old five -year kid that can't hold it? 
Yeah, you are. Every once in a while, you'll get one. Um, also set that expectation with your buyers at the buyer consult that we don't use bathrooms and homes so they can make sure that they're prepared for that. Um, beverages and snacks, you'll win your clients over every time. Ask them what their favorite beverages and snacks are for a long day. Get one or two drinks, a few fruit snacks for the kids. They'll think you are God, I promise you. Um, any? Yeah, I don't know. Um, graphite for sticky locks. I've never had that problem. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. That was a shock to me when I saw that in there too. So, <laughs> um, I've never heard that mentioned in the. Yeah, I'm assuming. Um, so yeah, maps. Of course, it's kind of invalid at this point. None of us are using MapQuest anymore. Those were the fun days. Um, flashlight is really good, but I would say tape measure is probably my most used. Make sure you have one in your car and a good one, not a cheap one, but a good one that can measure a big room, get the job done. But how do you feel about shoe covers? I keep shoe covers in my car. Um, I keep them in my car because in the instance that we're in a property where the sellers have asked us to take our shoes off and my clients are uncomfortable doing so. I want them to have shoe covers. Okay. So not everyone's, you know, if we're wearing flip-flops in the middle of summer, not everyone's comfortable walking around someone else's house barefoot. Yeah. So I have shoe covers in my car at all times. Okay. They're yeah. really cheap and on Amazon. Yeah. I was just curious because um, like, do you keep them in your toolkit? Yes. Okay. Yep. They're in the trunk of my car right this second. Cool. Yep. I do. I also have disposable masks. Um, obviously that was a real hot thing. Um, but I do still keep them because every once in a while you'll still come up on a listing with someone that's still kind of freaked out and that needs to be respected, of course, especially because there's cameras. You guys are aware of that, right? There are cameras everywhere. So make sure you're respecting the seller's, um, requests on that. Okay. Also, do you guys have iPads? Highly recommend. Um, I use a thing called GoodNotes. You can import any PDF into it and then write all over it. So I give hand like paper copies to my clients at the MLS, but everything else is loaded into their file on GoodNotes. And then it's one less thing that I have to carry around. You can go on the MLS on it, all the things. So highly recommend if you guys have one to start utilizing it. Um, it's honestly amazing. Safety first. Um, just remember, it's not your job to show homes, it's your job to sell them. Your safety is never, ever, ever a reason to risk or selling a home is, <laughs> you look really confused. <laughs> selling a home is never a reason to risk your safety. Um, UCAR has an app called Forewarn. You do have to pay for it, but it's a really inexpensive thing. You pay it on a yearly basis. You can look up any phone number and it will give you criminal history, their real name, their address, the type of cars they drive, where they've lived. It's really great because if you're getting cold leads, um, you can just confirm that they, who they, that they are, who they say they are. You can kind of fact check them a little bit. You can also, I think it's in the Supra app. You can send out your location to someone. If you're at a home with someone, you don't know, um, set it up. Thank you. Showing time. I knew it was in one of those. Um, also always knock before accessing, even if you don't think it's there. I've shown a home once with a renter in a bed that was super awkward. And they had a gun and a pillow next to them. And I had little children with me, so it was very sketchy. Um, I did knock, but evidently not loud enough. So definitely knock. What I do is I go and I knock really loud. Then I go get the key out. Then I come back and I knock again. I open the door and I announce myself. Um, you don't want to knock and then just walk in. Doesn't give them time to get to the door. So, um, yeah, that sucks. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh.
That's rough. Wow, that's rough. That's rough. Some of those things you just don't get out of your brain. So, uh, okay, let's see. We are running out of time. So I'm going to just kind of skirt through this a little bit. Um, so this sell homes, not show homes. This goes back to keeping your buyer's top five and your needs analysis up to date all the time. Make sure you're not just opening doors for people. Also, make sure you have your pre-approval letter. I have really gotten um, pretty stern about that with my buyers and it saved me a lot of time. So make sure you have that pre-approval letter before you start showing homes. Blame it on the brokerage, blame it on COVID, blame it on whatever you want. But I highly recommend doing that. Sorry, I know you said you were going to speed through these, but um, question about this slide. Yes. How, how do you go about that? Like, let's say they're afraid to commit, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you coach them through that? Or how do you work through that part? Or like your pre-approval? How do you do that? How do you coach them through the pre-approval? Um, well, you said you've gotten pretty stern about yeah. making sure they're pre-approved. So... Yeah. I mean, how do you, if they're hesitant, how do you coach them through that without being aggressive? Yeah. So I'll be honest. And it took me a long time to do this, but I'm not going to waste my time. Um, and I will flat out tell them that if you are not serious about getting a pre-approval, then I am not going to be serious about taking my time to show you homes. It's not because I don't care. It's because I do care. I don't want to show you homes that you can't buy. This market is crazy enough. You're going to have to act super fast anyways. There's no point to me showing you homes that you cannot put an offer in in five minutes. No point. And that sounds mean. I promise you it's not. It makes sense to them. We are working for free the majority of our career. We're working for free until we get paid. Okay. No other profession does that. No other profession. Do you not at least have a retainer on file? or something to protect your time, you have to protect your own time. Getting a pre-approval is a very small thing to ask your buyers to do before you start spending time on them. I also will explain to them that I have clients that have gotten pre-approved that are desperately trying to find a home and to take time out of my attention for them in this market for a buyer that is not serious is simply not fair to the clients that I have. Once they are pre-approved and once they've committed to me, they will get the exact same loyalty and time and commitment as my current buyers do. But it is my fiduciary duty to protect that for my current clients. And I can't do that if I have a buyer that's unser not serious taking my time. I like that because you work it back into your value proposition. Exactly. So, deal. Yes. Thanks. Yes, you bet. Um, if they're afraid to commit, I would also say find out why. What is it? Is it because they don't think they're quali they'll qualify? Is it because they don't want their credit pulled? What is it? Help them walk through that. Um, I, had a, I had a buyer, I grew up with them. Uh, they were high school sweethearts. They were my brother's friends. We grew up in Northern California together. I worked with them for three years. They were pre-approved the entire time working with my, with my lender. They had a BBA the entire time. They never bought. I finally said, I can't keep spending time on you guys. I didn't say that to them, but I said that to me and I kind of stopped following up with them. They bought six months later. You know what? That's okay. Go live your life. My time's important. So, you know, you just have to protect it. They obviously had a reason that they weren't comfortable sharing with me and that's totally okay. Sometimes, even though you're friends, it's not a great fit to work together. And sometimes you have to figure that out. So that may be the hesitation, you know? Make sure it's safe for them to share that with you. Um, always go back to their motivation, their needs and wants. Always advise them as a consult and a fiduciary. Allay their fears. Um, a lot of people are worried about getting their credit pulled. Let them know that as long as we close, it's not going to ding them because you can pull it as many times as you want for the same thing in 30 days and it will only ding them once. A lot of people don't know that. Um, solve their challenges. What is the challenge? Is it that you have a, ki a kid that you don't want to bring to showings? Hire a babysitter for them. Offer it. Bring someone, and it doesn't mean that they have to leave their kid. Bring someone with you to showings that can sit in the car with the kid so that the parents can see the home in peace. Okay. Calculate the cost of waiting. Were all of you guys in team meeting 
was it this last week or the week before when Shoni was going over, it was the week before when Shoni was going over uh, with our property manager, Samantha Wallace, the cost of waiting versus renting or renting versus buying. That's gold, you guys. That was an aha moment for, I think, all of us. Make sure you incorporate that into your value proposition or into your consultations. Okay. We have one more section. I'm going to run through it super fast. I'm available to stay for questions, but just out of respect, if do are all of you guys good if we go a little over? I'll text him and be like, I'm keeping your people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what ahas do you guys have from this? It is 11:30. Okay. We'll we'll hurry then. Um. Any ahas from that real quick, just off the top of your head? Yes, seriously. If you guys have, I mean, if you're a religious institution, you have older kids that can do it or your kid's soccer team, like give them 10 bucks, have them come with you for a day. It's amazing. You know, get them a swig. They'll love you. Um, they're super, this business is, is not easy, but it is very simple. It is very, very simple. Um, you just have to solve problems. Okay, sellers. Let's get into sellers. Like I said, we're going to do this super, super, super fast. So in the other section, well, first you'll notice pricing their home competitively, um, marketing to potential buyers, selling within their time frame, and helping them find ways to fix it up are all in the top. The three that they didn't put on there that are in the other category are help a buyer, help find a buyer. Notice that's not in the top, which is really interesting. Help with negotiation and dealing with buyers and help with paperwork, inspections, and preparing for settlement. I always ask my sellers, especially in this market, what are your expectations of what offers we are going to receive? If they're thinking, let's list at 525 because we're gonna hit 600, you gotta correct that. We are no longer hitting 600 if you list at 525. Okay, those days are gone. So, I mean, every once in a while we might get one. I did. I do have a townhome that just appraised for way over anything we had ever expected. But it's. Uh, I had a townhome in Spanish Fork listed for 325. We got six offers on it. It appraised for 368, and I negotiated the buyers to come in with 8,000 over appraisal. So we're at 376 for a two-bedroom townhome in Spanish Fork my clients are thrilled. <laughs> the buyers, not so much, but my clients are thrilled. So it's fine. Um, and we close next week. So it's great. And so that is still happening, right? A little bit, but the expectation and what I had told those clients is that that is not happening. We did end up taking the offer that would allow it to happen if a miracle occurred, which it did. Um, but you've got to set those expectations. I had told them 350 max is probably what you need to be prepared for, probably more around 340. And that's kind of what they needed to walk away from that house. Um, so just make sure you're having those, make sure you're having that conversation, you guys. Expectations is so important right now. Price, time frame, and conveyance. What is conveyance? Exactly. Perfect. So those are their top needs. Price, time frame, and conveyance. Price, obviously the highest they can get. Time frame in the quickest amount of time or in the time frame that fits with their life. It's not always the quickest. Um, and conveyance. So when is possession? How is that working out? Um, all of those things. Is there delayed possession, lease back? All of those things. Those are all important. Sellers' lives change. I had a client who literally the morning that we were accepting offers had one life. And by that evening, they had another one. Um, things are crazy. Everyone's going through something. Make sure that you can adjust and help them through that. Stay in touch, over communicate, all of those things. Price and condition. Those are the things that the sellers can control. It's pretty much the only thing that the seller can control exclusively. 80% um, of the buyers for a property are going to see that property with the, within the first couple of days. 
So if you're not priced right out the gate, you are gonna lose 80% of your buyers. Don't price it right later, price it right now, okay? Um, a lot of sellers right now are going to say, can I please list it high just to see, make sure they understand we are in a shift, things are changing. I'd rather price at comps and get at awesome offers than price at high and get no offers. We're seeing more price reductions, more days on market, all of those things right now. And condition, you know, a long time ago, last week, sellers weren't having to do anything to their homes. Um, a lot of sellers were being lazy. A lot of listing agents were being lazy and not having their sellers do anything to the home. Um, that's gonna change here. It's changing already. Make sure your homes are in good shape and are well presented. Sensitive seller conversations. This is a fun one. <laughs> um, this is where you go back to how honest can I be with you, okay? Um, a lot of people have smells in their home that because they live there, they don't even realize it. And it may not even be a bad smell, it may just be a unique smell. Um, that's a hard conversation to have when you have people that you know live clean, but their house smells a little bit and you're not quite sure what's going on, make sure you have those conversations. Um, the condition, if someone's lived in a home for 10 plus years, they've lived there, they don't even see the dings on the walls anymore, okay? They don't see how cluttered the, the closets are. They don't see any of those things. Deferred maintenance is a big thing. Um, personalized decor, removing animals. We do live in Utah, we're a big hunting state. Not everyone wants to buy a home with a bunch of dead animals. I am included in that. I would not buy a home if there's dead animals in it. Just who I am. Not everyone feels that way, but have those conversations, okay? We wanna be as open to as many buyers as possible. So it is a business transaction. They need to be reminded of that um, in order for them to get the most. Make sure they lock away cash, jewelry, and medications. Are we okay, Molly? Okay. We're going a little over, so medications, yes. Um, I've had medications stolen from a listing of mine before. Yeah, so make sure that, you know, a lot of people are walking through homes, especially at open houses, right? They walk in and you're like, yeah, go look at the house. No problem. They're walking into every room with no one with them. They can look at anything. So make sure all of those things are put away for sure. Um, obviously, if there's any illegal activities going on, put those away too. Um, make sure uh, that those are taken care of. Um, price, obviously these discussions are gonna have to happen more often than not. Set that expectation, of course. A uh, great agent and client communication. So we're going to go back to this and it provides a strong foundation for sustaining a relationship, sets and manages expectations. There's that word again, proactively. Always do it proactively. Always, always, always. Again, you can never over communicate and creates peace of mind for your clients and enhances your credibility. Um, let's talk about fair housing. And then I think it goes into marketing too, but let's, I feel like fair housing is important, um, especially in the communities that we have here. So what is fair housing? Okay. Okay. What is it? Religious. Okay. Gender. Familial status, yep, perfect. Why are those things important that we have that conversation with our clients? Bingo. Is any deal worth losing your license or your reputation? I recently had a client as you were reviewing offers. What are the demographics of that offer? Can't tell you. And honestly, I don't even know if I remember. Okay, we cannot discuss demographics. Before your guys' time, love letters were a really popular thing. The NAR has since come out and said, Riley, I'm going a little over, sorry. Um, have since come out and said, 
no go on love letters. This is what I recommend. If your clients feel really strongly about writing the love letter, have them write it, read it, take out anything that is a fair housing violation, and then you can submit it. Just remember though, love letters are not part of the offer. They are in addition to the offer. They do not have to be represented. As a buyer's agent, if my clients want to write one, I encourage it as long as I review it first. So a seller's agent, I do not present them at all. A love letter as in me and my husband and our five children have moved here and we are so excited to live in a white community and to be so close to the Mount Tibnogos Temple. Or um, me and my husband or me and my wife love this home. We can't wait to raise our family in this community. Uh, we loved that you guys are also a family. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on, right? So you can say, love this about your house, love that about your house. We love this about the community, all of those things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yes. Yep. 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 Now as a seller agent, I want it to be a business transaction. As a buyer's agent, I want it to be emotional, of course. So there's a difference there. Okay. Um, I do let agents, I will always ask an agent when I'm submitting an offer, are you guys accepting love letters as long as they don't violate fair housing? And if they are, then I'll have my buyers write one. But if people ask me that, I let them know I do, do not share those. So you can sum up, submit one if you want. Um, and at the end, once the offer is chosen, if it doesn't violate fair housing, I will share it with my client, but I don't allow it to be shared in the middle because the numbers are what matters as a seller agent. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, Riley, are we good to take a minute? Okay, um, let's go into marketing. Oh, this is important. Did you guys, I can't even do it. Why four C two T's? This is the thing that you'll hear a lot at KW. Um, no one knows how to actually say it correctly, um, but it's important that you know what they stand for, <laughs> okay? So win, win or no deal, integrity, do the right thing. Customers always come first, commitment in all things. Communication, seek first to understand. Creativity, ideas before results. Teamwork, together everyone achieves more. Trust starts with honesty, equity, opportunities for all, and success results through people. 14-step marketing plan. Um, there is a little bit of a hands-on thing that we were supposed to do. We don't have time for that, but I'm assuming since you guys are already actively using command, you probably are already familiar with this, where you can take your listings and do like import them into the designs and create cool marketing pieces. Um, Professional photography, please always do that. Um, we have a lot of people that think they're like professional photographers with their iPhones or their Samsungs. And some are, but the majority are not. And it looks really poorly on our profession as a whole to not have professional pictures um, on your listings. Make sure you're setting, oh, we skipped one. Can someone read that for me? The, the message you put out to attract prospective buyers and sellers is everything. Why would they want to contact you in this market? What would they get if they did? These two questions are at the heart of all effective messaging. I would put those two questions up near your desks. Make sure that every piece of marketing material that you guys put out for your listing or for your brand, go back to those two questions. Um. Okay, these are some things, the right documents, we kind of went over that earlier. All of these things can be uploaded, the seller's property disclosures, title reports, um, offer expectations. If you've had an inspection done already, all of these things can be uploaded to the MLS if you guys want to, and I highly recommend you do. Um, it helps a buyer feel more comfortable putting in a solid offer as well as it just shows that you're on top of your game and it 
just looks great. Um, utilize the right professionals to get great pictures and floor plans. Floor plans are gonna start being a, rec or a requirement of our MLS, I believe, and they're gonna start offering a service for that. So that will be really neat. Um, and then set the right schedule. Of course, this goes back to setting the right expectation as well as what is the right schedule for your client. And let's just clarify too, that a $150,000 listing deserves just as much service as a million dollar listing, okay? Um, so this is where they're just showing what you guys can do on design. And I think we're done. Let's see, no, we're not done. Hold on, I think we're skipping some things here. Oh, signage. Let's go over signage really quick. Um, do you guys, are you guys using like team signs or what do you guys have for your listings? Yes. Team signs? Okay. Um, one thing that I would make sure you guys are aware of is every HOA is different in what they allow. So in a lot of your townhome or condo communities, they won't actually allow for cell signs. Your clients could actually be fined if you put a for cell sign out. So make sure you're getting that clarification before you submit or before you install signs as to what that looks like. Some will allow them in the window, but not an actual sign in the lawn um, and different things like that. So make sure that your clients don't get a fine for that because you put the sign in the wrong spot. And then NAR clear cooperation. Are you guys aware what that is? So the clear cooperation is when you list a property um, within one business day. So once you start advertising a property within one business day, it needs to be listed on the MLS. So if we can't do like coming soon, or if you have a sign out, it has, you can install the sign more than 24 hours before you put on the MLS. So make sure you guys are aware of those things too. And Riley can definitely go into that with you. You're not supposed to do coming soon. Um, you could do it within the 24 hour time frame, but you can't do it like a week before if it's not on the MLS. Yep. Um, make sure that that's kind of a new thing within the last like five years, I would say. And they're pretty strict about it. So make sure you guys are really familiar. It's called the NAR clear cooperation policy and it's nationwide. Um, success with co-agents. We've kind of already talked about this. Um, be workable, be communicative with that co-agent, start that, that relationship off really well. Um, also, don't forget that Keller Williams has profit share. Are you guys are aware of that? So Keller Williams has profit share. If you guys work with an agent that is like fantastic, give their name to Shoni. Shoni will recruit them for you and get them into your proper, your profit share and then suddenly you have a super passive income that's fantastic so anytime you work with an agent and you're like they would be killer if they were only at kw give their name to shoni angie fisher i believe has a text that she sends out riley will probably have access to that for you guys um highly recommend doing that and any i think that's about it any other ahas or anything like that that you guys want to talk about or questions Good. Sorry, went over so long. We did start kind of late, I guess. So I guess we didn't really go over, huh? Nope. That, but we're right on track. I guess we were right on track because Tyler, we did start about 10, 15 minutes, huh? Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, guys.